Well, thank you everybody uh, for coming along today, both on Zoom and in person. Uh, I want to acknowledge that we here in Monash are on the lands of the Kulin Nation, land that was uh, never ceded. So I pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. Uh, and before I just uh, hand over to Mia from the library in a minute, I want to say particularly welcome to Nick Long, who's joining us in person uh, from the LSE, and Natalie will introduce him uh, in full shortly, but I just wanted to give him a shout out. Uh, so probably enough from me. Mia, we'll just hand over to you for a quick word about what wonderful things we have here at the Monash Library. Thank you. And could everybody hear me okay? Um, so I've just shared my screen quickly. Um, we are lucky at Monash Uni to have a very large um, Indonesian um, collection, perhaps one of the largest in Australia, I'm told. Um, I'm just Serene today. Um, usually, Veronica Delacour is the um, Indonesian um, liaison librarian. Um, she covers most of the Asian languages and I cover most of the European languages. I am um, Actually, I'm also doing a PhD, but it's in French studies. Um, so I did spend some time overseas researching for my PhD, which um, I'm sure many of you will be doing. Um, not in France, obviously. Um, but I just wanted to point out um, that we do have a very, very varied collection um, at Monash. Uh, we've got some um, pamphlets, for example, and we've got a lot of um, materials in the general collection. But we also do have a large special collection. Um, and the special collection is not... Um, only open to Monash staff and students, it's also open to the general public. So anybody who wants to access the special collections at Monash, um, in particular the Indonesian materials, is more than welcome to. Um, and if you can't make it here, um, if you're overseas, um, then we have actually digitised a few of these collections and I thought I'd show you those quickly. Um, through, so through Monash Collections Online, um, you can see, for example, we've digitised um, Simpo. Um, which was published in Jakarta, which is not showing, but that's okay. Um, and also some Sukarno speeches um, that are only um, in type and they're not available um, online elsewhere. So it's pretty cool that we've got those, and there are a lot of them um, that were distributed over time um, that we've now scanned and they're available for anyone to see um, through Monash Collections Online. That's just a small snippet of the things that we've got available, but we are very fortunate to have a strong um, Indonesian studies community at Monash um, and the library is really lucky I think to be part of that. So thanks. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. All right. Well, we'll send back over uh, to you, Natalie, and it's just really wonderful to work uh, not only with Monash but uh, also with Indonesian Council and also with teachers. Um, we can see Liam here. So thank you and back over to you, Natalie. Thanks. Thanks, Sharon. And thank you, Mia. Um, so yes, this is a, a jointly run um, webinar, just as we did uh, back in September 2022, we're partnering with Monash, with the Indonesia Council, which I represent, uh, with our colleagues at Bryn in Indonesia, and we're also really pleased to be uh, partnering with the Chichis today, uh, represented by Liam Prince, who um, is here with us. Um, before we uh, get going, I should mention that we are being recorded. Hopefully you got that message when you came in, um, but just to be aware that the session is being recorded. And just as with the previous one in September, we will be um, uploading it onto the Indonesia Council website and making it available on YouTube. And I think Monash will also make it available over another platform. Um, so just be aware of that. If you don't want your face on camera, then um, turn your camera off. Uh, so I'm calling from Gadigal land. I'd like to pay my respects to elders past and present um, and uh, extend my thanks to their on ongoing custodianship and care of country and uh, the land and borders on which I, I work and live. So today we're joined by um, a cast of thousands actually and we wanted to do this as sort of an update following on for the, the September session which seemed to have an air of um, uh, <laughs> Everybody, everybody was quite concerned about what the change, changes were going to mean for them. So what we've done today is we've brought together a few researchers who have managed to obtain research permits and visas to work in Indonesia, to do research in Indonesia. So we wanted to have a bit of a good news story for you. Um, so we'll hear from each of them. We're also, of course, joined by a representative from Bryn, who I'll introduce in a moment, um, and she's going to be available uh, at the start of the session um, just to give us a, a little update and also to answer questions at the end of the session. We have been receiving questions um, over the last week, so we've put those together and she's ready to, to get through them. 
Um, so uh, without any further ado, let me introduce our speaker today. The first is uh, Tree Sundari, who is uh, from Bryn. Um, and uh, uh, Tree was appointed Director of Management for Research and Innovation Permits and Scientific Authorities in 2022. And prior to that, um, she had a Bachelor of Pharmacy at Ayalunga University and a Master of Health Science from Queensland University of Technology. Tree, thank you for joining us today. So Tree is going to speak to us for about five minutes just to give us a little update, after which we'll hear from our three successful research permit holders. The first is Evan Doran. Um, Evan, um, if you could just give us a wave, thank you. Um, Evan is a PhD candidate in Indonesian studies at the University of Sydney and his research focuses on Indonesian higher education. Um, and he's recently obtained his research ethics clearance permit and visa. So well done, Evan, that's great. And also Joanna Vogley, also from University of Sydney. Got a bit of a Sydney bias, I'm afraid, because that's where I work and I recruited the speakers. Um, so Jo is also going to talk to us about the process she's been through. Um, she's a PhD candidate in Asian studies and um, recently received the Carol Muller Award to investigate Balinese social entrepreneurs. Hi, Jo. And Jo's got a PowerPoint. She's always very organised. So. Um, so they're both going to speak to us for 10 minutes. And then our uh, next speaker of the three researchers is Associate Professor uh, Nick Long, Professor of Anthropology at the London School of Economics. Now, rather than talking about the tips and tricks of getting a research permit and visa, Nick is actually going to be talking to us about a few other things linked to the process of doing research in Indonesia, some new protocols, um, some new pressure points. So I'll, I'll leave Nick to explain that in more detail. Um, and then we're going to hear briefly uh, from Liam Prince and I think Sofi uh, Arinta. I'm not sure if she's actually here. Um, we'll hear briefly from them at about five o'clock and then we'll have about half an hour for Q&A. So lots of time for Q&A. Um, if you have questions, pop them in the chat. You can send them to me if you want them to be anonymous or you can just put them in the, um, in the group chat if you're happy for everybody to see your name. I've also prepared some questions that I've been receiving over the past week, as I said. So without any further ado, I will hand over to Tree to uh, just give us a five minute overview of what's changed since we last heard from Bryn in September. Um, any updates, any news about the website, the information that's available for us researchers. Thank you, Tree. Okay, thank you, Natalie. Thank you, everyone. Uh, I hope that my voice is clear enough, both in the, this Zoom and also from the mail, uh, sorry, Monas. Okay, uh, Natalie, I'm sorry that uh, in the previous one, I thought that I only, I have 10 minutes to say, but it's cut into five minutes. Okay, no, no, I, I actually, will... 10 minutes is absolutely fine. Okay, okay, thank you very much. I, I uh, you know, prepare some slide that will uh, perhaps help everyone to, you know, get the information better. So, wait a moment, I, I will... Share the screen. Uh, yeah. Yeah, we can see that. On screen. Okay. Right. Yeah, since uh, what we already talked in September last year, I'm sorry that perhaps uh, the improvement is not that much, but uh, <laughs> I will try my best to, you know, cover everything. So yeah, of course, I will start with the regulations uh, because this is the legal basis of what we are doing now in uh, giving the uh, services on the research permit in Indonesia. So number one is our law, uh, number 11, 2019 on National System of Indonesian Science and Technology. There is one article in uh, article 75 that are uh, that is related to uh, what we are, uh, you know, discuss today. So it's basically a room uh, that uh, foreign researchers can do research collaborations uh, with Indonesian partners. And um, based on this uh, law, uh, we have, uh, you know, a new procedure on how we are getting uh, the permit. And beside this law, we have the technical regulations uh, in Brin. It's about the procedure uh, on how uh, getting the research permit uh, through the ethical clearance. 
And what is the difference? What are the difference between, I mean, before and after that law? So uh, before uh, we have the law number 11, 2019, the proposal that coming to us will be reviewed uh, not only based on the scientific aspect, but also uh, other aspect, including security clearance. That's why uh, uh, it is uh, it was uh, reviewed by the by the committee that the memberships uh, you know consists of uh, representative from many ministries and agencies in Indonesia, including uh, the ones uh, from the security uh, agencies like police, like the intelligence agency, etc. But now uh, after we are having this law. Uh, all of the proposal uh, will be reviewed uh, uh, by the ethical clearance with, uh, under the scientific uh, aspect, and it is done by the ethics committee. And for you uh, who has the who have the uh, local partners coming from Brin, uh, you are eligible to get the free of charge of uh, giving the uh, getting the permits. And um, these are uh, the requirement, required document that uh, you need to uh, prepare and submit to us. Uh, it's actually very concise compared to the previous procedure. Uh, in the previous one, we asked you more than 10 document, I think 15 or something. Uh, but now we only uh, ask for these six. Of course, uh, we need your proposal of research that uh, more or less, you know, uh, uh, this is the outline. So it will giving uh, the committee uh, information of what uh, your research uh, activities will be. And we also ask for the other documents that required by the ethics commissions, because we have five uh, ethics commission and each of these uh, commission will ask for different uh, document based on the characteristic of the research. And we need uh, your ID, uh, passport, valid for a minimum of 18 months. And uh, we also need the document of uh, collaboration between uh, your institute, institute and also your local partners in Indonesia. And uh, the fifth is the guarantee letter from your uh, local partner in Indonesia. And the last one is material transfer agreement if it is needed. Of course, if there is no material transfer out of uh, 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 Indonesia to other countries, then uh, this document uh, doesn't need it. Okay, all the uh, services is uh, online based. So you go to this uh, website, clearance. Uh, clearanceethic.brain.go.id. Uh, this is our second uh, version. So it's already bilingual. So uh, the foreign researchers can uh, submit the proposal by uh, themselves. Or you still can ask for help uh, from your local partner to submit on behalf of you. Uh, like I told before, we are in Brain. We have five committees. Uh, ethics committees on social. Uh, second one is care and the use of animals. So this one is not necessarily um, if you if you use the animals on the lab laboratory, but also if uh, your research only like uh, surveillance, uh, you don't have the treatment to the animals, you still have to submit to this committee. And the third one is Committee on Health, chem, uh, Chemistry, and also Nuclear. This is our general business process. So after you, you know, you go to our website, and if you already have the uh, our SSO, a single sign on Brin, you can use the uh, username and password. And if uh, you don't have it yet, you just register to get it. And after that, you just do the self-assessment. It's basically the, you know, uh, close questions. You you just answer yes or no based on the characteristic, based on your research proposal. 
it will uh, you know, help you to identify whether your activities of research will need uh, ethical clearance or not. So if uh, you need ethical clearance, you just go to one of the uh, ethics committee and you upload a document. Uh, then we will, uh, you know, the secretariat will uh, send it to the ethics committee and it will uh, review it and it could be approved without any note or you can, uh, you know, you will be asked for some revision or it could be rejected. But uh, for this case, um, usually not because of the substance of the research proposal, but it's more about, um, you know, not submitting in the right uh, time. For example, the ethics uh, clearance uh, have to be submitted before before the research activities, but some others still, you know, uh, they already do the research uh, or field uh, work, then they just submit it after that. So it's not ethical for the ethics committee, you know, to give the uh, approval after uh, the field work. So basically, uh, it will go through until uh, they verify the blacklist and uh, a payment and uh, we will issue the, the permit. But if you, uh, by the nature of your uh, research proposal, doesn't need the ethical clearance, uh, you just go to the, uh, you know, uh, others, uh, not one of the committee, but you just go to others. It's much simpler uh, because they will not uh, go through the ethics committee, but directly go to the secretariat of the, uh, foreign research permit. Uh, this is the same, but it'll, it will give you the, you know, uh, offer for you about how long does it take to get the uh, ethical clearance and also the permit. So basically for the ethical clearance, three plus 14 plus three days. So uh, if everything goes smooth without any revisions in, within the 20 working days, we uh, uh, can, uh, you know, issue the ethical clearance and another seven days to get the uh, letter of the research permit. <clears throat> now, what next after you got the permit from Green? There are several, um, what we call it after uh, post-arrival uh, procedure. Of course, you need a visa to, to, to come to Indonesia. And uh, for this index, C315, uh, you cannot apply for yourself. So you need assistance from your local counterpart to, you know, uh, to register and uh, apply for the visa. And then uh, after you got the visa and you, you come to Indonesia, uh, you need to apply for ITAS or limited uh, stay permit. Uh, and if you are planned to uh, visit Indonesia several times within a year, then uh, we suggest that you also apply the uh, MERP or M multiple exit re-entry permit. So for the next visit, you, you just use that so you can uh, go and back uh, with that uh, more easily. And, and then... Uh, you need what we call surat keterangan jalan. I don't know how to, you know, uh, translate this into English. Uh, I, I'm maybe traveling letter, not really close with that meaning, but you need to go to the uh, police uh, office. Uh, unfortunately, it's still, uh, you know, not online based. So you or your local partner uh, have to go to the uh, office to get uh, to apply uh, for this uh, letter. Uh, it's quick, only need, uh, I think, one or two days to get this permit. And you don't have to be, uh, you know, you know, apply it in Jakarta if your uh, location of the reset is outside of Jakarta, you can apply in, in the local uh, police office in that area. And the third one is uh, research notification letter or SPP from the Ministry of Home Affairs. Uh, 
uh, and it's already online based. Um, actually, uh, you can apply this letter after your arrival in Indonesia. But then uh, Brin already talked to the Ministry of Home Affairs. Uh, we are trying to minimize the time that the foreign researchers uh, spend in, in Indonesia uh, uh, only for the administrative uh, procedures. So we, we, we are asking the Ministry of Home Affairs whether is it possible for the for the foreign researchers to apply uh, for this SPP before the arrival in Indonesia. And uh, Home Affairs said that uh, it is possible uh, as long as uh, you already got the uh, permit from BRIN and the visa already issued by immigrations, then you can uh, apply uh, for this kind of letter. So, when you are still in uh, Australia, you, you can apply uh, for this letter. It will be very helpful because you can reduce, uh, you know, time you spend in Indonesia and uh, directly do your field of uh, work. And for the other two, it's not compulsory, but it uh, depends on the research uh, topics. If your topic is on the biodiversity, for example, and you need to enter the conservation area, then you need to go to the Ministry of Environment and Forestry uh, to get the uh, permit uh, for entering the conservation area. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, it's still not online based, so um, you still uh, you know, have to go to this office. And we are in Brin also, starting the communication like we already did with the Ministry of Home Affairs, whether uh, foreign researchers can apply for this permit before their arrival, because um, it it will take, uh, for me, it will take a long time because it's usually more than one month. So it's really pity if, if the researchers already uh, come to Indonesia and they only you know, wait and uh, completed their uh, permit and they cannot directly go to the uh, field. But uh, we are still not have a chance to meet. Uh, hopefully soon uh, we can discuss this and they will agree on our proposal. And the last one is uh, security clearance and also accompanied by security officer by the min from the Ministry of Defense. If your research uh, will use the research vessel or other floating vehicles or equipment or, you know, uh, aircraft survey, including a uh, drone or air balloon. So, yeah, you need another uh, permit from the Ministry of uh, Defense. If not, then you don't need to go to these two uh, ministries. And the last one, I only give you statistic. Uh, this is the letter that Prin uh, already issued last year in 2022. We opened the service uh, around April with this new procedure because on January and February, we, we still use the uh, old uh, procedures and we have we had moratorium on March and we uh, came online again uh, in April. So the total uh, letter that we already issued is 368 and I believe that uh, this year the number will increase. Uh, this is just give you a background uh, based on the nationality. We, uh, you know, make like a 10, 10 best countries, 10 more countries that come to Indonesia and collaborate with our researchers and Australia here in the sixth rank with uh, 17 uh, people come uh, to Indonesia. And this is the research topic uh, that are most, uh, you know, we collaborated with our researchers, ecology, meteorology, primatology, and etc. And uh, this is the data 
just for Australia, just give you an overview. As I mentioned this year, the number is uh, um, increased. Uh, like in this first three months, uh, we already issued for 33 um, letter uh, only for Australia. It's already uh, almost double than the last year. So yeah, it's uh, increasing. This is the topic uh, that we compare in last year and uh, this year in the last three months. So this is, uh, I think that I can share and later on I we can discuss in a Q&A. Uh, and if you have uh, any questions, just uh, you know, contact us in these two uh, emails. And I also uh, give you the link to our guideline book. Uh, it's not only the guideline for what you have to do uh, in print, but also what next after you got the permit uh, in in print. So this is all. I give it back to you, Natalie. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tree. That was um, really interesting. Um, thank you for tailoring it for our audience. Those statistics at the end were particularly interesting. Um, so we do have three of those um, 17 or 33 people with us today. So let's go straight to them. Um, uh, actually, uh, before I hand over to Evan, Tree, can I just double check with you? Would it be okay if you share your slides with us following this session and we can um, we can share them with our attendees? Okay, I'm not sure if um, Tree heard me there. I, I'll follow up um, separately about getting um, hold of the slides, uh, if if that's okay. Um, so let's hand over. Oh, thank you, oh, Sabina. Um, Sabina has it. That's fantastic. Thank you. Okay, let's go to you, Evan. Um, so Evan has his research permit and visa uh, and has not yet gone to Indonesia because um, waiting until Ramadan is finished. Um, so Evan, if you could share with us your top tips and tricks for getting this far. Thank you. Sure, thanks, Natalie. Hi, everyone. Uh, yes, I do have um, everything that I need, I think, at this point, and I'll be heading over later this month. And yeah, I think I've got much of a, a sort of a good news story. It was a fairly smooth process for me. It was a bit longer than the, uh, the timeline that uh, Tree just shared there. It was about 12 weeks to get the, uh, the research permit and then a further couple of months to actually get my visa sorted out after that. And it all went fairly smoothly. I was very fortunate that I had um, EGM as my, um, my sponsor or my guarantor of the labels change. Um, and so they, they were really helpful. Um, the first part of the process of doing the ethics clearance and getting the research permit, I did myself rather than burden those guys with, uh, with the extra work. And then you have to use the, um, your sponsor to actually get your uh, research permit. Um, and then they became invaluable there. I didn't really have any headaches for most of the process, but, but there, were, there were two that sort of threw me a little. Um, one was, first one was um, arranging to pay for the uh, permit and the, uh, and the visa, because you have to use an Indonesian bank account. And it wasn't, I, could, I didn't, wasn't aware that you had to do that until that point. And when they issue the actual, um, like with the research permit, uh, you have seven days from the day of issue to arrange payment, which threw me. And then I had to scurry around and eventually um, Natalie and uh, Liam um, came through and helped out with that. Um, I don't know that that's always going to be a problem. I don't know if I made issues for myself there. Um, and uh, but yes, uh, that seven day period and getting it all organized was a little stressful. I think at the moment, the, the thing that's concerning me most is uh, all the documents that have been issued, um, uh, the research permit and the, um, the ethics clearance letter. Uh, that comes first, the ethics clearance letter, then the research permit, and then the visa. They each have different dates. Um, which is concerning me. So I've been contacting people. And I must say that the, uh, the Secretariat of the, uh, of the Ethics Committee has been really responsive when I've emailed them. They've got back to me quite promptly with, with advice. Um, but I have been a little concerned, especially reading through some of Joanna's stuff about making sure that all the um, T's are crossed and the I's are dotted with, with regards to documentation. So each of those documents currently have a, have a different date and 
uh, one of them, they, 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 the very first, um, uh, the ethics clearance letter actually runs out um, shortly uh, before I've even got there. So I've, I'm having to now just go through and contact people to try and get them all lined up properly so that um, when I do get there, um, and those, the, uh, the in-country stuff, again, I'm probably really fortunate um, because I just have to turn up, as far as I understand it, I just have to turn up to the, uh, the international office to do Gayen, and they're going to walk me through um, getting the various permits that, uh, that Sri just um, described. Um, and yes, so sort of anticipating that there may be some questions asked of why there are different dates on each of the documents, I'm hoping that everything will be in line, uh, reissue of the letters and stuff like that before I get there. Um, as I say, the, the, I found the process fairly straightforward. The, the website's pretty good. Um, there were two guides um, at the end of last year to help me complete the process, uh, one in English and one in Indonesian. Uh, they've actually a new guide, I think, that's been issued um, last month or this month. Um, and they're pretty clear and pretty helpful. The website itself is easy to navigate. Um, and yeah, so I certainly don't have any complaints. And as I say, the, uh, the, the secretariat's been quite responsive when I uh, ever had uh, a contact with them. And so, yeah, that, that's kind of my story. I've not taken 10 minutes. That's um, that's yeah. much appreciated, Evan. Thank you. I love people who run under time. Um, two questions. Um, Jo was asked to submit her application in Indonesian, not English. That was also the case for you, correct? Yeah, I, I, I did everything. And who helped you? Did you write the Indonesian version yourself or did your collaborators help yeah, with that? Yeah, yeah. A pity to the poor, poor people that had to read it, but yeah, I, I did all of that. Okay, great. Um, and then could you just tell us what the problem was with the payment um, and the sort of time constraints you came up against with that? Yeah, well, I received the um, the email um, at like 6 p.m. on a Friday and saw it and went, oh, yeah, beauty, it's there. Uh, didn't worry about it until Monday and then realised that it actually had to be paid in the next few days. Um, and so uh, then I had to scramble around because it was a bank account. The um, My contact at, um, at UGAM um, had, I didn't really want, because she said that it's going to have to be paid from an Indonesian account. I didn't feel that it was appropriate for me to sort of burden um, this person with uh, drawing on her own money and to be then reimbursed by me. Um, that has subsequently happened again. Um, and it, the problem was fairly, uh, it wasn't really a problem the second time. Um, but at that first time, because I wasn't aware of it, uh, it threw me, and then I had to scramble around and get some help, which, um, yeah, Natalie and Liam came through to, uh, to help smooth that through. Um, so I guess, and it doesn't, I don't think it's, I've seen it anywhere in any of the, um, any of the guides to advise you that, look, you know, you're going to need an Indonesian account, access to someone with an Indonesian account to actually pay for your visa, uh, uh, for your uh, permit and your visa. And they both get issued with a, a seven day deadline. So, uh, yeah. Yeah, it doesn't leave a lot of time to set up a bank account if you don't have access to networks um, who do have Indonesian bank accounts. Okay, thank you, Evan. Uh, question from someone in the chat has asked, is this about the Indonesian, uh, the thing that had to be submitted in Indonesian, specifically, this is a research proposal to be in Indonesian. It was the research ethics and visa application that had to be in Indonesian. Is that um, correct? I think, yeah, but I think, you, I think it does say, I think you can submit it in English, um, but it was just easier to get everything done in Indonesian at that time, um, as poor as the Indonesian might have been. Okay. Um, well, let's go to Jo because she was asked to submit hers in Indonesian, so perhaps she can expand on that. Um, and Jo has slides, so over to you, Jo. Thank you. Uh, so just very quickly, I am investigating Balinese social entrepreneurs, which include human participants, which also made my um, application low risk. And perhaps this is the reason why it was processed uh, quicker versus, for example, a high risk application. Um, my research is under the supervision of Professor Adrian Vikas and Associate Professor Bunovi. 
And uh, for today, I was thinking I'll just quickly uh, provide you some information, very basic information on when to start. Uh, I kind of divided it, unlike even into a two-step process, which applies directly to my own experience. And then I also have this one big what not to do, which I think is very important, something I did, uh, which, uh, which wasn't correct. Uh, and then also at the process time, which was a little bit longer, um, than what was outlined here before. So where to start? Start in your home country, obviously, um, as, as we know, as outlined by, by uh, Boot3. To undertake this research in Indonesia, you need to apply for an ethics clearance and a visa. The ethics application was in Bahasa, Indonesia. Uh, I briefly outlined this here for the two-step process. The first part of the process took place in Australia for me personally, and the second part took specifically in Bali. So before you start your application journey, you will need to check with the university, obviously, if there is MOU in place and uh, with another Indonesian university. In my case, this took a little bit longer because we were in the process of establishing of, of uh, signing an MOU. And also, as mentioned earlier, you will actually need an Indonesian guarantor or a research partner as well, who is, again, responsible according to what is stated on the website. Your guarantor or your research partner is responsible for your residence, uh, for your actions, but also for all the payments that need to be done uh, via Indonesian banks. So what I did, I've transferred funds to my Indonesian guarantor for out of Australia, and then she was able to make all the payments on my behalf in Indonesia as well. Um, so let's have a quick look at uh, just some of the main points. So obviously the Indonesian ethics clearance, which I organized out of Australia, MOU, which was key, finding a local research partner, your guarantor, Connecting to the international office is really important. In fact, what we did, the three of us, my guarantor and one of the international office uh, people in Indonesia at Udayana University, we all sat down and organized a Zoom call just to clarify any roadblocks and to communicate really clearly, which was really helpful. Uh, because the process is quite new, some of you research partners may not entirely understand um, what the role is. So I think those type of conversations uh, are really, really important among the international office and, and the research partner as well. And then obviously you need to confirm your Indonesian address, which I struggled a little bit, and you need to organize a proof of residence uh, letter, which is the key. Uh, now there is in Bali specifically, um, when organizing your proof of residence, uh, in some areas, like the Gianya region on Tamp Tampak Sirink, where I stayed, I needed to organize the proof of residence via Ebanja, the community leader. So my recommendation is not to stay in, in, in those areas and, and stay in areas that don't require a letter from the Banja. So the immigration office is, is not consistent. Uh, some areas like Kuta or Jimberan in Bali, they don't require a proof of residence from a banja or from a community leader. Uh, you can go directly to a police office and request proof of residence. So you need to establish your proof of residence before you actually apply for your visa, or that's what I found. Uh, and then you apply for your visa. Uh, so, yeah, I guess the the proof of residence was a little bit tricky, uh, but I did manage to organize it uh, by, in fact, going to Indonesia in November last year and connecting to a banja as well. Um, now, in Indonesia, you have 30 days to organize your key tasks. My recommendation is to start on day one. Uh, because it can take time. This was just my personal experience. So when you arrive, you need to make sure all your documents are printed, meet with your research partner, but also with the international officer to cross-check all documents. There are a lot of those documents that you will require. So sitting down together, the three of you is really important. And you will also need an additional letter, which I originally didn't know about, uh, from the Indonesian dean to support your kids' application. So go a step back, your dean at the Indonesian University needs to issue a letter for your visa, 
and then a second le letter to support Chiquita's application as well. So there are two letters which are required from your dean, and you need to make an online application via the website with the immigration office as well before you go to the immigration office. So you can't simply show up at the immigration office. And uh, visit the immigration office and submit all your documents, including a photograph, although they will be taking another photograph a couple of days later you have to in Bali specifically come with a photograph as well. Do not forget to take a screenshot of your booking as well. That's really important. If you show up without screenshot of the booking that you have made online the day or three days prior, and they will ask you to search for it as well, which uh, is a little bit cumbersome. So consider the time required also for up to four to five visits. Uh, so you will be you will be firstly submitting your documents at the immigration office. They will ask you to come back for fingerprints. They will ask you to come back for an additional photograph. And then you will be asked to come back to make a cash payment. Uh, so make sure you organize enough cash as well. Uh, it's approximately $250. If there is no ATM next to the immigration office, you will need to leave and come back. And you will also need to come back for an interview and to collect your passport. So it does include a couple of visits, uh, or at least that's what I have experienced. And um, yes, so how long is the process? So really subject to the guarantor and the efficiency and local officials. Um, it took me a little bit longer than five months because I was waiting for other documents, but I think from, from now on, it should probably take approximately five months. I do have to say, it is it is quite complex for your research partner and a lot of uh, a lot of commitment as well because your research partner you're really relying on your research partner to make all the payments to organize uh, all the documents sit down with you but also communicate with the international office as well as with Dean. Uh, so that's uh, basically uh, it from my side. Yes, under five minutes, I think. Um, fantastic. Uh, Joe, I already anticipate that people will want access to your slides. So <laughs> thank you for making such beautiful slides and laying them out so clearly. Question that came up while you were speaking about proof of residence. Was this about your hotel or your lodgement? Exactly. I mean, okay. So did you have, did you book an Airbnb or, I mean, how do you know which little um, parts of Bali or which parts of Sulawesi or Java are going to require you to go and um, see the local immigration office and which will be happy to let that slide? You, you you don't uh, right <laughs> so you usually figure it out when when you arrive or the, at, at least that's what happened to me I figured it out when I arrived uh, and I always organized everything when in Bali but I think you know with, with the residence as well I think that's quite tricky as well especially if you're planning on doing ethnography as I did which required me to travel from one village to another village you still need to have one one proof of residence where you reside throughout the entire period. So you can't simply, well, if you change your residence, then obviously your guarantor is responsible for that particular change and needs to reapply for, okay. uh, I guess, new approval from the immigration office. Okay, so two questions. Um, and Joe and Evan, I might get you to take a look in the chat because there are questions coming through for both of you, which I think you'd be better placed to answer than I am. Um, but two questions, Joe, about did, did you arrive without a visa is the question. So don't make a mistake and don't arrive on a tourist visa. And that's exactly what I did. Last year in November, I went to a conference and I arrived on a tourist visa. If you arrive on a tourist visa, you then uh, cannot apply for uh, research for your kitas. So they will ask you to leave the country. Luckily, I had to leave anyway. So they will ask you to leave the country. And then once your visa has been issued and you receive the, the visa letter via email, you need to print it out. You arrive, you go to the immigration, and they will give you a stamp in your passport. And that's okay. when you can then go to the immigration to apply for your kitas. Does it make okay. sense? Yeah, that, that makes sense. And that's a good note of warning. I think Evan and Joe have both shed some um, good good advice on not what not to do. Um, okay, we're going to keep moving on. Um, we're going to now go to Nick Long. Um, hopefully you're ready to go, Nick. Nick is going to provide a bit of a different perspective on the new process. Um, so I'll just hand straight over to you, Nick, and you can take it from here. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Joe. That was great. Thanks. Great. Thank you so much, Natalie. Can people hear me clearly? 
Great. I also want to say thank you, a huge thank you to the Herb Fee Indonesian Engagement Centre here at Monash for hosting me as a visiting fellow of the week. And thank you to everyone for inviting me to this seminar. So I, I've really enjoyed uh, hearing from Evan and Joe, and I think it's clear that there's quite a lot of variability in the experience of getting a process based on the region that you're doing research and the nature of the counterparts. So I'm an anthropologist. Uh, I'm doing work at the minute in the Riau Islands, West Java and Central Java. But my counterpart is an institution, uh, it's just a very small institution, it's a Sekola Tinggi in the Riau Islands. It's not one of the big universities that's a centre of Indonesian academic power. That university, or the Sekola Tinggi, doesn't have an international office. Um, so it's a completely different proposition in terms of working and dealing with these things to perhaps some of the things that we've just heard. Um, but I want to work with that institution because they're people that I've collaborated with for the almost 20 years of my career in it. I want to be true and authentic to those relationships and continue that collaboration. So that's the kind of perspective that I'm coming from. I'm also coming from the UK, which is a context where there's not perhaps such an institutional culture of having Indonesia expertise or established MOUs with Indonesian universities because it doesn't have the same special relationship that Australia does. So that's also something that's maybe distinct about my perspective, but hopefully helpful feedback for Bryn and for these conversations. So I think the first thing, and the final detail I want to say is that uh, I've been through three regimes of research permits. My first research permit was with Lippi, I then had research permits with RISTEC, uh, and now I'm working with Grin. So I'm able to see this in a more historical comparative perspective. And I do want to say that I think in many ways the Brin system is working much better uh, than some of the previous ones. In particular, they're a lot more responsive to research queries, as Evan noted. I really do want to thank Brin for that. Every query I've had has been answered within 24 hours, which has not always been the case with previous agencies. Also, the Brin approach seems to be much more committed to decentralization to researcher autonomy to supporting the research that we want to do. Uh, with my current project, I initially applied for a permit with RISTEC prior to the pandemic, and I was told that I couldn't have the counterpart that I wanted, and I had to form a counterpart alliance with a well-known university in Java, which I felt was an inappropriate request, um, but I've had nothing like that from from Brian, everything's been very supportive, and uh, I think that's that's fantastic. Uh, so overall, I think there's been a lot of progress in the way that we're enabled to do what we want to do. But that has had a few drawbacks. So in particular, as we've already heard, the new system puts a lot of pressure on the local counterparts. The local counterparts have to assist with translation if the researcher is not fluent in Indonesian. The local counterpart has to pay uh, for the research permit. They have to pay for the visa. Paying for the visa is complicated because the visa payment needs to be in US dollars. So your bank account has to be with one of three Indonesian banks, Mandiri, BNE, or I think BNE. Yeah. BNE. yeah. Uh, so if you have a bank account with a local bank, as my university did, then you can't pay for the visa and you've got this seven day timeline uh, ticking away. Um, the counterparts don't know the system. In my case, because there was no international office, the counterpart wasn't even registered online to be a sponsor of the visa. Uh, then they had to register, but it turned out that the documents from the Yayasan were out of date and had an old Ketua Yayasan name on the document. So this led to a massive delay and it ended up taking me about seven months to be able to get the visa. And in the end, I had to fly out to the counterpart institution to help process everything and deal with this in person. Um, it would be a lot easier if we could just get the the visa sponsored by Bryn. Uh, and one of the other things that was not so good compared to the risk tech situation is the date on the permit is not the date of arrival, it's the date that you say your research will commence in your proposal. So in my case, I was hoping to commence the research in August. Uh, I didn't have the visa until much later. Uh, so then I lost effectively four months of time that I'd paid for to do research while I was waiting to get this visa. That was very different to the risk tech situation where you could have your research 
uh, research permit starting on the day that you arrived. So maybe there's scope to tweak uh, some of that kind of stuff. I also thought that when I was working with RISTEC and Lippi, one of the great things was you'd arrive in Jakarta, potentially as someone who's not spent very much time in Indonesia before, potentially as someone whose counterpart institution is a long way away, and you could immediately report to RISTEC or Lippi. That was where you'd go on your first day, and you had people to meet you and to be very friendly and to provide support and guidance on things like the police permits and the... Um, home affairs permits that Ipatri was talking about. In my case, at least, I didn't receive any guidance from anybody that I needed to get those letters. I only knew that I had to get them because I'd previously acquired them, uh, had been told by Lippi and Ristec that I had to acquire them. And the process of acquiring them, I think it would be very easy to put up some guidance on the steps that you need to take, and I'm happy to share my experience. Uh, the police was pretty straightforward, but it had to be done in person. The home affairs one also actually had to be done in person because you have to go and collect letters from the central home affairs ministers, then take to the home affairs department in every province that you're working in. So there's still a Jakarta visit required. And they would only issue me the letter once I had the police permit that I'd had to acquire in person in Jakarta. So the idea that you could apply for it before you even arrive in Indonesia seems counterintuitive. So there's, there's some, I think, clarification required in terms of what's, what's required by the Home Affairs Office. But I think that the key point that I really want to highlight, because it has broader implications for the culture of collaboration between foreign researchers and Indonesian counterparts, is that all of this pressure uh, and all of this power that is in the hands of the counterparts, that they're having to do all of this work, do all of these favours, creates a new kind of dynamic in the collaborative relationship. Because as the foreign researcher, you're now coming in really owing those counterparts a uh, favour. Now, in my case, I know these counterparts very well. They're my friends. I don't feel that there's been any uncomfortable or unethical practice. But I am aware of researchers who feel that unreasonable requests are being made of them by their counterparts. They're there to do their PhD research, but the counterpart is saying, well, can you do this lecture uh, for my class? Maybe it's a guest lecture. Maybe it's regular teaching that the counterpart is being paid to do. Can you come and be involved in this conference or this collaboration or these, these various opportunities? And the researcher doesn't feel that they can say no, even though it might be the right thing for them to do to say no. So there's a difficult situation in terms of the imbalance of power because you have to keep the counterpart on side because it's the counterpart who will be writing the letter to get your extension. It's the counterpart who needs to submit to Surat Pananta if you want to get your exit permit. There's a lot of fear that if you don't do these things correctly, you could be blacklisted by immigration, you could be blacklisted by BRIN. Uh, so it's, a, it's an area where I think compared to previously when everything could be done by uh, RISTEC and RISTEC would be issuing these letters. Now the level of power that's held by the local counterpart can create some quite uncomfortable situations and clearly there are safeguarding concerns that if there were a situation where uh, an Indonesian counterpart completely exceeded the bounds of propriety and behaved abusively towards a foreign researcher, what safeguarding or what recourse would that foreign researcher have? Would they be able to go to Bryn and change counterpart? Would Bryn write letters for immigration? And those kinds of procedures, I mean, we don't want to think the worst, but we have to think the worst to make sure that we can respond to these cases properly when they happen. I don't feel there's any sense of an awareness of what we do in those, uh, in those kinds of contexts. So I think that's something that it would be really interesting to hear what the, the Bryn representatives have to say, uh, just to assure anyone who's concerned about what happens if the relationship with the counterpart becomes untenable. I've also found, uh, as I say, my relationship with my counterparts has been really, really good, but I've found that I've been approached by a number of other universities who've maybe been hoping that I didn't have a counterpart and that I'm not doing the research properly, wanting to establish MOUs or wanting to be counterparts, and that they sometimes have 
unreasonable and I think unethical expectations of the kinds of collaboration that will be required, particularly when it comes to the co-publishing requirements. Uh, so, for example, one university was proposing that their researchers would act as a kind of research assistant. They would accompany me as I did all of the research. I would write the article and then they would be first author on the article in a scopeless journal because the universities are desperate to get high accreditation. Individual researchers are desperate to get scope of publication because of the system of rewards that exist in many Indonesian higher education institutions. And that can then lead to people making this kind of proposition, which is against the rules of ethical practice in the very scopeless journals that they want to publish in, which have very clear authorship criteria. And again, it's something where I felt I could navigate it and negotiate it quite easily as a more seasoned researcher. But clearly, this is an area where there's potential for conflict or disagreement or injured feelings, particularly with more junior scholars who just aren't aware of this minefield in their own academic context, let alone in the international collaboration. Uh, so I think my uh, my advice to any researchers wanting to establish this kind of collaboration is be really, really clear about the terms of the MOU. Um, really kind of spell out exactly who has a right to be what kind of authorship, author, what kind of acknowledgements will take place, make sure all of that is agreed and signed off. Uh, but of course, dealing with that could create further delays because maybe your prospective partner is not going to accept the terms that you want and then you've got to find another one. So it would be even better if we could have some kinds of guidance on best practice established perhaps uh, via Brin in collaboration with the Indonesia Council or the Health Feed Centre or Achiches or other organisations. Uh, because my concern is that if we do have these kinds of dynamics emerging where there's conflict with counterparts, what that's going to lead to is a centralisation of foreign researchers in a select few Indonesian universities that already have a lot of experience in the Western or non-Indonesian academic worlds uh, that already have a lot of power and that actually don't really stand to benefit as much from having foreign researchers present as places in the Riau Islands or places in Eastern Indonesia or places that have never had this before. And as we start thinking about how we want to be a more inclusive, decolonial academic space, it's really important that we bring capacity and research expertise and collaboration to a wide range of institutions in Indonesia. Uh, but at the minute, I feel that the dynamics and the level of power and the level of anxiety surrounding these permits might perhaps work to uh, fight against that or work against that. And uh, perhaps that's something that we can discuss uh, in the in the Q&A and think about how we could establish some kind of guidelines as to what's reasonable to expect uh, so that then everyone can operate within clear parameters and there's not this anxiety as to what can or can't reasonably be expected. So I think those are my, my broad points to make. I've had, after a frustrating delay, uh, a really positive time, but it's also made me aware of potential dangers that could be faced by other researchers. And I am seeing a little bit being experienced by some other researchers that I know. And uh, I hope that we can learn from that experience in order to make sure that the collaboration that Bryn wants to support can be as constructive as possible going forward. Nick, thank you so much um, for you know raising those issues and drawing attention to the potential uh, for, as you say, research to be centralised once again and for these smaller institutions to miss out because they don't have the MOUs or the international offices or the you know the staff to to hold our hands while we go through this process. Um, can I ask, is there a model or or is there a model collaboration agreement? I mean, when you're drafting yours with your partner, Nick, do you use an old one from 10 years ago or and then just update it based on the circumstances? So I used one that had been posted as a sample on the RISTEC 
website when I applied with uh, RISTEC for a research permit back in, I think it was 2011 or thereabouts, and which I just adapted a little bit. Uh, but it did need quite a lot of additional work to produce an MOU that was appropriate for my project, appropriate for the BRIN expectations and workable for all parties. And it ended up being quite a hefty document, it's like four or five pages. Yeah, um, yeah. So I'm happy to share that document yeah. if that would be useful. Obviously, it's dealing with a social science and an anthropological um, project where you've got You've got different kinds of data sharing issues because the anthropologist has having an individual experience and the local counterpart is having an individual experience. It's not the same as, for example, gathering a data set by a research instrument, which can be straightforwardly shared. So to some extent, um, some of the provisions around intellectual property in the data set might be unique to yeah. the type of project that I'm doing and not extrapolate extrapolable but at least it's a model for people to work from and there i'm sure there must be others in other disciplines yeah who that's could the thing models that could be used uh, i mean i think that would be um really valuable if you're talking about where organizations like i don't know indonesia council or or um the herb faith center or you know i don't know if the teachers is interested in, in this i don't want to throw you all under the bus but um in terms of looking at areas where we could add value certainly we could host those sort of documents on our website but I mean, yeah, maybe developing like a sort of template that can be adapted based on um, the specific research circumstances and making sure that it has um, all the uh, all the information required. Because one of the questions that did come through was what should be covered in the collaboration agreement between um, researchers and the Indonesian institution. Yeah, and I'm, for me, I would say the key thing is who has ownership over certain kinds of data, who can write certain kinds of things what are the procedures by which you agree on authorship uh, because i mean this is also something that i've encountered in my my field site that there are some things that i want to publish that my counterparts just don't want to put their name to because it's sensitive in the local context and, and there might be some things that they want to publish inspired by some of my research findings that i don't want to have my name on because i don't agree with it so then thinking about actually how those kinds of dynamics can be worked out and what general principles would be used. Whether or not it goes in the document, I think it's really important that these things are worked through at an early stage. Yes. And, and, and this also then raises the question about if you find that the relationship with the counterpart has become unworkable and you might prefer to move counterparts because you encounter another university that seems a better fit, what's the protocol for that? Um, in terms of uh, how Bryn would administer what was going on. Is there any capacity to be able to have an evolving sense of collaboration with multiple partners if you find that actually there's someone else who, uh, you meet who would be an even better fit? It feels like it would be good if there was a capacity for that. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, just made some notes. Um, uh, yeah, look, we're happy to... Uh, we'd thank you for offering to share your model um and we'd, we'd really be happy to host it on our website um i think there'd be a lot of interest in that and perhaps exploring um developing a, a template um okay next on my list is liam um liam prince who is director of the australian consortium for in-country indonesian studies um liam is just going to talk for a couple of minutes about sort of broader institutional support for you know doing research in indonesia um, and then we will go to the Q&A. So I'll hand over to you, Liam. Thanks, Natalie. Um, it's been really interesting hearing from everyone. I'm mainly here to listen, I think, and hear uh, how the process is working at the moment. And so thanks, Evan, Joanna, and um, Nick for that. I, I guess I'm here because um, certainly prior to the pandemic, our office, the Secretariat based here in Perth, would be getting emails and phone calls on a relatively routine basis um, whereby um, we had researchers and the like looking for advice and also support, um, wondering whether there wasn't a teachers for post-grad research or, 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 or for those services. I guess we took that fairly seriously and it was put to the reference group, the governing body of the teachers just prior to the pandemic at our AGM in 2019. And there was a proposal that was signed on off for us to do a bit more ex exploration around that. I'm sure that works a bit out of date now and listening 
um, it almost certainly is out of date. I guess I'd, I'd just like to observe that. Um, and the reason we were interested in it is because there's so many parallels to sort of the bread and butter of what a teacher does in any given year. Before the pandemic, we were organizing not C1, uh, C315 visas, but the 316 visas that the undergraduate students go on for about 100 semester students a year and about 400 of the B211A visas as well. The semester students also need to get not a, not a surat, it's in an Olympian or the SIP that um, Tri was talking about, but the surat, it's in Balazar, which is sort of the accompanying document that we need to get out of the Ministry of Education. But really, a teacher was set up to do a similar thing, right, which is to take a very low volume, small scale activity, like in this case, getting research visas for what, 50 Australian researchers a year. Um, in our case, it was how do we take a low volume activity of getting Australian undergraduate students, like the 100 that are going to put their hand up to go and do uh, undergraduate study in Indonesia in any given year, how do we pull that scale nationally so that we can actually create a, a, an administrative support for that. Um, so I'm still kind of convinced that there might be a role uh, here for a teachers if we could manage to do that. We obviously have some assets we could bring to the table in terms of having an established way of the Australian, the 19 Australian, oh, sorry, 17 Australian universities that are currently members. Um, we have, um, you know, a, a legal found you know, a, a foundation with bank accounts and whatnot set up in Indonesia to facilitate simple things like getting a payment from, a, from an Indonesian bank account uh, made. Uh, and similarly here, like an established sort of an online payment portal that we use for our programs amongst the Australian universities at this end. Um, so there, there could be, I mean, ideally, right? Bren, Bren would sort this out and immigration would sort this out and it would be easy for the individual researcher to just do their thing. But we might be waiting a little bit of time, a, a little bit of time to do that. In the in the meantime, I, I'd still like us to be part of this conversation and to see if there are ways that we can assist. Maybe it's a very minimal way of sort of edging into it, where we, like we did with Evan, sort of just be there to facilitate um, payments where that where, where that's difficult. But and and up the scale from there. So I, I, I'll this will be my last point, and I'll hand back to to Natalie. So. In the case of our programs facilitating undergrad student mobility into Indonesia, um, the Australian universities through our teachers have developed this national way of, say, signing an MOU with an Australian with an Indonesian university on behalf of the group of universities, which lays out the terms of that collaboration. And that means that we only need one of those agreements with with UGM. We only need one of those agreements with UNPAR or you know IPB or whatever. So there may well be some learnings from that we could apply to this particular area of activity. That's all I had to say right now. And thanks for inviting us me along Natalie. Yeah thanks Liam and thanks for your help with um, facilitating those smaller scale payments but also your interest in um, exploring what else we could do uh, to bridge the gap until um, until this is resolved um, and hopefully it will be. Okay um, Tree uh, I know you've had to turn your camera off because your internet is unstable I just wanted to check you're still there um, otherwise our question and answer session is going to be very difficult. Yeah, um, I'm still there. Hi. I'm still here. <laughs> Wonderful. Sorry. Good. Sorry. Okay, Sorry. no, no, that, that, that's fine. That's fine. Um, okay, so I do have um, some questions and uh, I have received quite a lot of questions about short-term visits. Um, uh, so at the last information session in September, um, it was mentioned that short-term visits uh, of uh, less than 30 days could be done on a limited stay visa without any KITAS permit. Um, but it seemed that there would still be a week of running around, even um, if it's only for a week of research. Uh, is there still that amount of administration for a very short visit, uh, for a very short research visit? Uh, Tree, you're on uh, mute. Yeah, yeah. Uh, sorry, just uh, unstable uh, connections. Uh, some of your sentences I cannot hear, but um, it's about a permit for the short uh, visit, right? That's right. Okay. Uh, yeah, uh, I just, um, you know, just checking to my colleagues in immigration whether the um, visit under or less than 30 days, they have uh, 
they have need to have the uh, limited space permit or not, but uh, he hasn't answered yet. But um, if it is for training, uh, if it's for training less than 30 days, uh, it's already confirmed that you can use uh, other type of visas. So you can use the uh, social visa. That's for that's for training. But for the research, uh, even though it's a short period, uh, you still have to use the research visa. But um, whether you need or not uh, to get the limited stay permit, uh, I need to double check with my colleague in immigration. Okay. For the um, so, less than 30 days. Yeah, so we don't have um, a clear answer on that, it seems, at this stage. Um, what about multiple short-term visits? If somebody plans to make short research visits of one week um, mm -hmm. throughout the year, is it better to do the limited yeah. stay visa many times or to get a, a research visa? Uh, I think uh, you can uh, use the MERP, the multiple exit re-entry permit. So if you plan to visit several times to Indonesia, you can use that. So you don't need to, uh, you know, uh, go to immigration office uh, every time you, you come to Indonesia. So by having the MERP, you can, you know, it's make you easier to to come to Indonesia and back and forth like that. But you still need a C315, a temporary stay visa for research. Yes, yes, yeah. yes. Okay. Visas, yes. Okay, that's a clear answer. That's great. Um, now, we also understood that there would be some more information shared on the website about short-term research. Has that been updated? Is there new guidance on short-term research on the website? I, I know there was some new um, guidance released just recently. Does that include short-term research? Uh, not yet. Not yet for the short-term research. Is there any but, indication? Yeah. yeah, sorry. Go on. Yeah. There is indication by our proposal, actually, but we don't know whether the immigration will uh, agree on green proposal. Basically, we, we are uh, trying to copy what uh, immigration already, uh, you know, giving permit to working visa. So when they are uh, using the working visa and they arrive in uh, international airport in Indonesia, they can directly cut the um, uh, ITAS, a limited stay permit. So we are trying to propose for the uh, research visa, uh, C315, to also get that kind of service. So once you arrive in the international airport in Indonesia, then the immigration will give you that stamp like uh, uh, for the limited stay permit. That's our proposal, <laughs> Briggs proposal. But we uh, don't know whether the immigration will, you know, uh, agree on on that uh, result. Yeah, I understand. So we're interfacing with Bryn, but of course Bryn is also working with all these other agencies in the background. So um, patience, patience. Uh, at the moment, the only is it correct that the only international airport where you can get that stamp for your um, C three one five is in Jakarta. Yeah, that's, that's what I understood, yeah. Okay, so one of the questions we had was um, from somebody who wanted to know if there if she had to travel through Jakarta to organise her visa and immigration process after she gets her permit. So it seems like the answer is yes. You have to go through Jakarta to get all that sorted and you need to allow about a week. No, no. No, we have uh, some international airport, not only in Jakarta, like in Bali, it's an uh, international airport. Then, I don't know, Makassar, perhaps? Yeah, so Jakarta is not the only uh, international airport. So you don't have to uh, come through Jakarta. You can go directly in Bali if your research location in Bali or in Makassar, if I'm not mistaken, is also already okay. international airport. Yeah, Joe jo has said 
Jogja, um, yeah, Jogja, yeah. Jogja, Jogja uh, Bali. Um, so you can get all the stamps and all the um, visits to the police and um, home affairs and the, all those things in other parts of Indonesia. It doesn't have to be Jakarta. How do uh, researchers find out where where those arrival destinations are? <laughs> Is there a list? Oh. <laughs> Sorry, come again. Well, um, it, if if uh, so, we know that you can do this in Jakarta. You can do it in Jog Jakarta. You can do it in Bali. Yes. How can we find out the other destinations where research uh, visas can be processed and, and permits? Uh, you mean if uh, the ah. Uh, for the uh, for the permit, uh, if they are already online, then you can do in anywhere. Um, but for for the permit that you have to go uh, physically, like um, yeah, like traveling permit from police, to, so you don't have to go to Jakarta for now. So you can uh, go to the local police in that province. Is that what you mean? Sorry. If uh, so well, no, that that's okay. It's it's about whether you can fly into other parts of Indonesia, such as Sulawesi. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, without needing to go to the police and home affairs in Jakarta or or Bali. Yes, yes. So, is it possible to do that in Sulawesi and yeah, and it's elsewhere? Possible. Okay, it's possible. All right. Okay. Um. I hope that answers the question from that person who submitted it. Um, very helpfully, Tree has supplied those um, email addresses. So if it's not clear, please feel free to reach out to those emails. And as um, Nick and Evan have both said, they're very responsive. Um, I wanted to come to this issue of research counterparts and hosts. Mm -hmm. um, what should hosts do to support researchers? Is their guidance provided somewhere? Or is it just yeah. about individual negotiation? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, through this uh, new procedure, actually, uh, there is also a fundamental changing about uh, the role of the counterpart. Because in the past, uh, uh, RISTAC, uh, in the past, the Ministry of Research and Technology was the uh, guarantor of the foreign researchers. So RISTEC was the one who provide, provided the letter to immigration, letter to home affairs, and et cetera. But now uh, this role uh, move as the responsibility of the local counterpart. And we already uh, uh, informed this to all the Indonesian uh, institutes that uh, now uh, their role are very important very strategic. Um, there's already, uh, you know, uh, information on the immigration uh, regulation. If I'm not mistaken, there is a law uh, of immigrations uh, that uh, cover what the rules of the uh, local guarantor. So basically, yes, they they have to be. Um, you know, partner that uh, help the foreign researchers to do the uh, some administrative uh, uh, matters and also uh, for the research activities itself. Yeah, it's a big task, I know, but uh -huh. uh, some of the <laughs> yeah, some of the uh, institute like um, big uh, university, for example, they have an international office uh, usually. Um, the researchers or lecturer will be supported or they will uh, receive uh, assistance from their international office in their um, uh, universities, something like that. Thank you, Tree. Nick gave a good example of his Sekolah uh, Tinggi in Riau, I think where they do not have an international offer. So obviously there are going to be challenges for those people working with smaller institutions. Yeah. Um, I wanted to pick up on Nick's question or, or point earlier and to ask whether there is a complaints mechanism or something 
um, with Bryn if your research counterpart or your host does something wrong or acts unethically? Is there some way, some form of protection for the researcher? Yeah, actually, um, based on the regulation, uh, it's clear what are the uh, obligation of the research, uh, foreign research, uh, foreign researchers, and also the, uh, you know, Indonesian researcher who received the uh, funding from uh, overseas. Uh, uh, in in the law, uh, there is uh, Article seventy six. I think in the last of my presentations, I also put that, but I, I didn't uh, saw it. Um, if the local counterpart, you know, uh, asks for something that it's unethically, uh, for example, they ask for uh, their name to be, uh, you know, co-authors in 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 the publications. You can say no if they don't have any contributions on that so basically uh, uh it has to be clear uh what you and your partner uh collaborate with uh collaborate on and what is what is your right what is your uh, obligations and what is the uh, local partner right and obligations so it has to be uh written clearly in the in the agreement or MOUs. Yeah. So if they ask outside of that, so you can remind them it's not our deal or something like that. And so you that, also can, yes, uh, 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 inform us about it, inform to Brin. Okay. And should we do that through our contact at Brin or through the email address yeah, you've provided? Sure, sure. Yeah, you can do that. Thank you. I think that is a great reminder of how important it is to get the collaboration agreement right. Yes. <laughs> um, so so um, fora like this where researchers are coming together um, are really important because it's it's these people who've gone through the process who are going to be able to share their experiences and we can um, improve each other's collaboration agreements with each iteration. Thank you, Tree. This is really helpful. One last question about research counterparts. Um, this person is researching in Jogja, but they also want to visit other universities, other parts of Indonesia. Do they need more than one research counterpart? Can no, they just if you oh, one sorry. is enough? Go ahead. It, so I'm sorry, yeah. is, is one research counterpart enough? Yeah, if if uh you know if you only visit, <laughs> of course you don't need a, uh, another MOU for uh, with that uh, you know counterpart. So basically, the the MOU is within the framework of your research activities. If there okay. is other activities outside of the research, if like you know giving the lecture, uh, speak in the seminar, or something like that, you don't need to, have to get another MOU. Okay, that's excellent. Thank you. All right, we're going to move on to some other questions. I heard of this new Collaborasi visa, but maybe I've been misinformed. Is there a new Collaborasi visa and what is it? Yeah, actually, I asked this to immigration and they said there is no Collaborasi visa. <laughs> okay. Perhaps, yeah. <laughs> yeah well, that's that easy. No that's great. <laughs> that's one less visa to worry about. We'll scratch that off the list. Thank you. Okay, yeah. more questions. Um, I think we had this question last time. If an Indonesian researcher is working for a foreign institution, okay, no. Do Indonesian citizens studying in Australian universities need to obtain ethics clearance from Bryn? Uh, and the research activities is in Australia or in uh, Indonesia? I think the research activities is in Indonesia. Okay, if the research activities is in Indonesia, then they need to get the ethical clearance uh, from Indonesian committee. Yeah, okay, good. That's very clear. Um, uh, um, there is a stipulation of providing raw data um, as part of these um, this process of obtaining permits but what if mm -hmm. sharing raw data is prohibit, prohibited 
by my my university, for example? How can we work around this? Yeah. Uh, talking about the regulation of the data management in Indonesia, uh, actually there is an obligation to back up, yeah, uh, back up uh, primary data and the research output in uh, our database. We call it uh, RIN repository uh, in Indonesia. Actually, a repository in the national. It's a national. Um, a scientific repository. So we only ask for backup and for the access to that data, it's, uh, you know, BRIN will, uh, you know, uh, will not ask for the access. So we only ask them to back up the data in our uh, repository. So the access is fully depends on the researchers whether it will be open data or it will totally close so it's okay so we don't ask uh, researchers to open the, the data to us we just ask for them to pick up their data in our uh, national repository that's uh, what the regulation mentioned yeah i don't really understand what you mean by backup does that mean you have all the raw data but you can't access it? Um, or does it mean um, that the data that you have is anonymized and there's no sensitive information contained in it? Sorry, I'm not clear. Yeah, it, it could be both. Uh, what I mean is uh, we have uh, like a data first, a data first and data set and, and also the, you know, other um other type of uh, how they can um uh, save the data in that repository so when you back up uh the data to our repository system it means that you just put the data there it could be you can you can anonymous the data it's okay okay that's great uh you can also uh <laughs> yeah that's great. Okay, thank you. Um, coming back to this question of Indonesian students studying in Australia, they do need ethics clearance if they're going to conduct research in Indonesia. Do they also need an Indonesian counterpart? Um, no, no, no. Because um, for the Indonesian student who study overseas, uh, and do the research in Indonesia. Actually, usually they already affiliated with the uh, Indonesian Institute, right? For example, uh, a lecturer in E, for example, and do the study in Monash, and they collect the data in Indonesia. They just need the ethical clearance, and they can ask the ethical clearance uh, to. Uh, example, they don't have to get the ethical clearance from Green if, if it is for the Indonesian uh, student. Okay, thanks. Now, one last question from Sophie. Um, this is a good one. Uh, what sort of visa do you need if you just want to go to Indonesia to set up new research collaborations? So, building new networks, establishing trust, finding out who you can work with. What sort of visa should you do this on? Uh, you can use VOA if it is uh, available, or you can use the visa on uh, visit, what we call it, social culture, something. So, source boot? Yeah. Source boot, yeah. Okay. And what was the first one you mentioned? V8? Uh, visa on arrival. Ah, oh, VOA. Oh, sorry. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, that's good. Okay. Apparently, SOSPUD is very complex now. Yes. Um, okay. It requires collaborations are already in place. So maybe visa on arrival. Yeah. Um, yes, because uh, I think since COVID, then um, individual cannot apply directly for the visa. They need to be like, uh, you know, Indonesian counterpart. <laughs> but uh, yeah, Indonesian institute in, in, institutes well, who can apply for the, the visa. Okay. okay. All right. 
Now we are at 5.30. Um, we started on time. I'd like to finish on time. Um, I want to thank all our speakers today. There's been a lot of information shared. Um, jo has, um, has developed some really great guidance documents. So if you're interested in um, having a look at Joe's guidance documents, um, I think we'll see if Joe will give us permission to put them on the Indonesia Council website along with this video. Some people need information urgently. So if that's the case, um, please feel free to reach out to me and I'll see what I can do to connect you with the right people. Um, I'm just popping my um, email in the chat for the person who is facing that situation. Um, but for the rest of us, I would like to say thank you. Um, it's been really informative and I would particularly like to thank Tree who has made herself available in the middle of what is no doubt a busy day, um, has communicated so clearly uh, given us great resources and um, Tree, thank you very much. Um, Ramadan Mubarak and we hope to see you again at a future um, Indonesia Council, Monash Herb Faith Centre, Achichis uh, or whatever combination of uh, institutions we can manage uh, at one of these information sessions. So thank you, thank you again and to all our speakers, Joe, Evan and uh, Nick, thank you. <laughs>